creatives, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we have gathered. In my case, it's the northern part of Sydney and a home of the Garrigal people of the Eora Nation. And I pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. Now, if for some reason you can't stay for this full hour of this session, you can always watch it later on YouTube. And you're also welcome to post any questions you may have into the YouTube chat and we'll get to some of these later. Well, today I'm delighted uh, that we're going to be joined by five very talented storytellers, all of whom have immersed themselves in their passion projects. Firstly, the creative forces behind the ABC's popular four-part series, Misrepresented, which is of course a very timely exploration of politics from a female perspective. And we're joined by Annabel Crabb and director Stamatia Maruthas. Also, Jane Castle is going to be discussing her deeply personal film about her mother, who's renowned filmmaker Lilius Fraser. It's seven years in the making, and when the camera stopped rolling is the definition of a passion project. And finally, um, and so is Ablaze, uh, the true story of the first Indigenous filmmaker, William Bill Onus, and a collaboration between Bill's grandson, Tariki Onus, and filmmaker Alec Morgan. So welcome to you all. Really glad that you could join us. Thank you. G'day. Hi. Um, let's start. Uh, first off, Annabelle, I'm going to start with you <laughs> because your project, we've all, most of us would have seen it on the ABC recently over the four weeks that you ran it to air. Where did the genesis of the idea come from and how difficult was it to pitch it to the ABC? Because if you're talking about a series of women and politics and in the parliament, it mightn't have been the easiest sell. So how easy was it and where did the genesis come from? Um, well, um, hello from Gadigal Country, by the way. It's lovely to join you uh, today. Um, I uh, have been thinking about this for quite a while. Stam and I have been talking about it along with our um, colleague, Madeline Horcroft, for about five years now. And I think it was actually going back to when I was working on a book called The Wife Drought. I did a um, chapter that dealt with Edith Cowan, who was the first woman elected to any parliament in Australia, and that was 100 years ago. And she, you know, she had a very tough time. She was mocked. She was the sort of subject of a national syndicated column and cartoon paying her out. She was interrupted in her maiden speech. She only lasted for three years. There wasn't a bathroom in Parliament House. I mean, she had a tough old time of it. But um, I remember when I was learning about her, she had an incredible life and she also used her time in Parliament to try and establish a minimum wage for housewives, which is actually, as far as I can tell, the only attempt that we've made in the history of this country to literally value domestic work. But um, she, I thought at the time, okay, that's 100 years in 2021. Now, 2021's a, a long, long way away, but wouldn't it be cool to hang a series about women in parliament off that anniversary? There's a funny thing about um, anniversaries, you know, and centenaries and things. When you can hang a project on a landmark like that, it's easier to get people to talk to you because they think, well, I'm doing this for history and I'm doing this for posterity. So it was a good device to um, get people to talk. Uh, it was not the world's easiest sell to the ABC just because um, it sounded a bit plodding, you know. Um, its working title was 100 Years of Women in Politics. <laughs> and... Uh, I think it would be fair to say uh, that it, it didn't exactly set the world on fire. Um, so all that we had really was our assurance that it wouldn't be dull. Um, and uh, I think it was probably a bit of a wing and a prayer um, that the series wouldn't be dull. And that was, um, you know, a bit of a gamble, I suppose. But um, I think we did it. I don't think it's dull at all. Um, so No, and it just goes to show how important the title is. <laughs> to actually right. bring people over. I think that was what, you know, really came out loud and clear. And Stamatia, you started shooting this last year, um, I think from about June in 2020, and actually finished shooting it in December last year. And then, of course, the whole Brittany Higgins story broke in March. So were you and Annabelle concerned about the fact that really, at the end of the day, you got all your interviews in the can, but suddenly there was this major development in the, the sphere how did you wrestle with that, both as filmmakers and storytellers? Um, that was super difficult. I mean, we were 
like Annabelle just said, the concern was that the series would be dull to start with. Um, so we already had, uh, you know, um, concerns about that. But then also, once we finished shooting in December, we actually felt quite good about the interviews we had captured because um, there were just so many stories that were new. Also, we found our cast were just, um, they were funny. Like, they were... Um, I guess they were, the interviews were incredibly entertaining and, and a lot of them were um, just, you know, eye-opening. And so we, we sort of felt like we had good content, but then by about February, when all these sort of stories were coming out of Parliament House, um, we decided to sort of change our outlines um, per episode to sort of um, adjust or to make sure that we sort of framed um, you know, the stories that were that were sort of, um, you know, being reported daily to make sure that they were somewhat inclusive in our series. And we knew that it was going to be um, a difficult a difficult path forward because it was being reported on every day. So we sort of thought about, well, how do we kind of sit above that and give a broader perspective um, uh, in terms of women's experience in Parliament House? Mm. Well, let, let's have a look at um, one of the clips, one of the most talked about clips from the series. And um, Annabelle, I'd like to come to you straight after this clip. It's a phenomenon that I've described as gender deafness. And it occurs not only in the federal cabinet, but I've experienced it elsewhere. And so many women have told me they've experienced exactly the same thing. It's one of those classic frustrations that we all have as women in politics. You do do a few eye rolls and you get the raised eyebrow. It's extraordinary that it persists today. Oh, of course it's happened to me. It's probably happened to you. You're the only woman in a room and you come up with an idea or you say something. And it's like no one hears you. You are the only woman and you put up an idea and then they look at you and go on debating. And you think, oh, OK, that was a dud. And then the next person speaks. And suddenly, your idea... It only has to get two or three chairs along till the bloke says it. And then the next one actually appropriates your idea. Maybe in different terms and say, so, oh. And everyone goes, oh, that's a great idea. And then all the men around the table nod and say, what a good idea. Hello. Did, did I not... Is there an echo in this room? It's kind of... It, astonishing when it does. You sort of think, didn't I say that? I think I just said that. And all of a sudden, everybody heard it, and it's a great idea. Let's go around the room and everyone says what their opinion is. And we'll start with you. What do you think we should do? I said, well, I think we should do ABC. Male number one. I agree with Anne. We should do ABC. Male number two. I agree with male number one. We should do ABC. Male number three. I agree with males number one and two. By the time we went around the room, they were all patting each other on the back for their wonderful idea that they came up with. This is the power of invisibility that we have. This is not something that I've created. The number of women who've told me... That happens all the time. It's as if men in power, they still find it hard to accept that good ideas can come from women. Oh, two. Yeah. Feels like ten. Woohoo! Um, we're back on. Uh, Annabelle, um, you, were you surprised to find this unison of voices across the party divide all saying the same thing about gender? Yeah, I was actually, because, I mean, we were dealing with a fairly wide spectrum of views there, everybody from, you know, um, Bronwyn Bishop on the, just picking the screen right, <laughs> uh, to Sarah Hansen Young, I don't really agree on very much. And I'd, I'd heard Julie Bishop say the thing before, um, privately about um, not being heard and that kind of gender deafness thing. So I knew that if I played my cards right, she'd talk about it. But um, it was weird that well, after we'd done about five or six interviews, they'd all said the same thing unprompted and in such similar terms that we started to see this possibility for a sequence where we could just edit them together. And it's quite powerful because, you know, you could watch that whatever your opinion was and you'd think, well, these chicks aren't all making it up, right? <laughs> like there's something going on there um, mm. in that culture. And I think that that phenomenon rings a lot of bells for a lot of women, you know, who don't work in politics but work in um, other um, areas as well. So 
one thing I would say about that sequence is that it's um it was a big lesson to leave space in your preparation for the stuff that comes out in interviews that you're not expecting. Like we'd done a lot of prep and archive research and we'd kind of done quite a bit of structuring of how we thought the episodes would go. But we kept being reminded that sometimes you get gold that you're not expecting to get um, in interviews and so you've got to stay flexible. Yeah, no, look, it was certainly a, a, a universal story that you hear across corporate Australia and Australia, so uh, I really enjoyed it. Jane, can I go to you and your film? Your journey, uh, you began your journey to tell your mother's story, Lilius Fraser, story back in 2013, so eight years ago. Um, and like the female politicians in Misrepresented, your mother was a trailblazer, uh, but in her case as a director of, in the film industry. What led you to make a film about her and in doing so a film about you? Yes, um, well, Annabelle's point about staying flexible, I think I we took that to an absolute extreme because I actually didn't want to make a film about my mum in the beginning. I wanted to make this kind of philosophical, intellectual film about death with all these interviews. And um, my very wise producer, Pat Fisk, said, oh, you just go off and write, do some writing. And I did just do some writing and this amazing story, really intriguing story about mum's death actually fell onto the page. And then when we showed people, you know, all this material we had, you know, nuns and monks and people who were dying and people who died and come back talking, and then we showed them this, this um, scene about mum's death, Death, they were like, they were really interested in a film about mum. So it's like, okay, fine. Um, that's where we're going to get the support from. So that's the film we're going to make. And it was actually the last thing in the world I wanted to do. I didn't want to, I was just like, Ugh. I was still a bit resentful about, you know, she'd had this life where she'd focused on film and juggling motherhood and career. And we had a lot of intergenerational trauma coming through our family. And I wasn't really ready. But it was a no brainer. Like, here was another woman who had not, you know, she was just buried in the archives. No one really knew about her outside the film industry. Her daughter's a cinematographer. There's this really interesting story about her life. Um, yeah, so it became about her, but then in the making of it, I realised that um, just her life, it wasn't going to be enough for the story. It just mm. wasn't enough to hold. And what was really interesting actually was our relationship. So more and more was kind of like pulling teeth to get me into to the story it was like ugh, um just resisted that at every stage but it was really where the film was trying to take us it was I was always trying to be really loyal to where the best story was mm -hmm. and trying to let go of my agenda because it was always it was like the film knew that it wanted to come into being and the film knew the kind of film it wanted to be and luckily we had the time to do that. And, you know, over many years, I would sit with our editor, Ray Thomas, and we would kind of, instead of like a top-down approach so where you have a script and then you execute the film, mm. it was very much bottom-up. It was like, it's like an artwork or a sculpture. And we just kept working with the material we had, trying to allow the story to come through. Because in the beginning, I really didn't know what the story was. And it was actually only by the time we finished the film that I was like, oh, my God, that's what the film's about. It's about mother-daughter, it's about filmmaking, it's about women trying to break through, and it's about intergenerational trauma. So, yeah, very different process. And it's about vulnerability too, which is not easy when you've been a behind the camera for many, many years and suddenly you're stepping in front of that camera and narrating a film that's so deeply personal. Absolutely. Like, I, I loved hiding behind the camera <laughs> most of my career and just... Oh, just look at the world through a lens and you know can look at look at them look at them not me but I mean I was mortified that I had to come out um, accepting and just really you know this film would like self-select what what it would spit out and what it would include and you know there's some very vulnerable parts about me in the film and luckily it's not all in in there but you know a lot of feedback we were what we were getting along the way was that um, it was too confessional and that was, like, mortifying. I did not want to make a confessional film, but luckily, you know, I listened to that feedback um, and we showed it to a lot of my colleagues along the way. We had a lot of feedback screenings with audiences and friends and we just really um, took, on, took on that feedback because it's very hard when it's a personal film to get mm -hmm. any perspective. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, it eventually made it over the line. We got there. 
Let's have a look at the trailer for uh, when the cameras stopped rolling. Action! She was one of the first women to shoot her own movie. By the time I was five, she'd made over 15 films. Grabbing the camera from the boys and shooting anything I could get my hands on. I'd win awards and give them to mum and she'd put them up on her wall. It sounds like a great mother-daughter story. But off screen, things were a bit more complicated. Only fragments of memory remain. I moved to the US and got a big American agent, shooting non-stop. But the truth was, I was running away. I'd become a cinematographer to get closer to mum. And it wasn't working. It's so easy to blame the mother. And images can be misleading. And it, it, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you started this process in 2013. Uh, we've now seen the trailer. Do you feel in your heart of heart that that film is finished or is there still more story that you wanted to include in there uh, that you simply couldn't because you have to draw a line in the sand when you're telling such a personal story? I was just talking with Pat about that earlier. I mean, I'd like to quote the, um, the choreographer, Martha Graham, no artist is ever pleased. And I'm absolutely not pleased. And I could absolutely, um, another six months or even a year, oh, my God. And I, I know the film would be a better film. But, yeah, you have to draw a line. I mean, we had funders. We had donors. We, I mean, like, the amount of people that just kept saying, when are you going to finish your film? For years and years, um, you do. And, you know, all, all pieces of film, all, all artworks, they're all snapshots in time of people just doing the best they can with the material they have at the time. And of course, time moves on. And then, yeah, if I started like the film now, it would be a completely different film, like completely and utterly. So you just got to honour that process and let, you know, letting go of it. It's, it's a bit painful, but you know, it's part of the process. Well, it's a, it's a true definition of a passion project, and which leads me to Tariki and your film, which it's interesting, we're talking to um, Jane, who's, you know, created a film around her mother and her relationship with her mother, and you and Alec have created a film around your grandfather, William mm. Bielonis, um, and, uh, you know, you've done a deep dive into his life, but it's, a, it's again, a very deeply personal story. Mm. Um, can you? It was six years in the making, and something of a detective story. How did it mm. happen? How did it come about? It came about somewhat out of the blue. I was uh, walking out of a lecture theatre, just having delivered a lecture to a bunch of first year students, and in it, I'd talked about a seminal piece of Australian film from 1983 called Lazarus Little Sixpence, amazing documentary, and. In terms of intercultural collaborations, one of the first times that a filmmaker has really just turned up in an Indigenous community with a camera and a roll of film and said, what story is it, is it important to tell? And it was made by, um, by this filmmaker, Alec Morgan, whom I didn't know, but uh, I spoke of, I thought, relatively highly in this session. And all of a sudden, half an hour later, I get a phone call. Oh, hello, literally Mr. half Onis. an hour later. Literally half an hour after I walk in this room. Right. Hello, Mr. Onus. You don't know me, but my name's Alec Morgan. I'm a filmmaker. I made a film called Louds and Little Sixpence. Yes, I know. Immediately, I assumed to myself, has one of, does one of the students know Alec? Have I said something that he's taking offence to and he's ringing up to 
to uh, to take issue because it was with. such no. a seminal film at its time in the 1980s when Alec and made it. Disturbingly, it's just as relevant now as it was then in some yeah. way. But extraordinary yeah. film. And so I was somewhat on the back foot. There was a pause, and Alec, Alec said, "Do you know your grandfather might have been the first Aboriginal filmmaker?" I said, "No. I mean, I, I, I know that he made films. I know that he filmed stuff, but those films were all lost. They were destroyed in a fire." To which Alex said, no, I found the film in the archive that I think was made by your grandfather. Oh, can I come down to Melbourne from Sydney and show it to you? I said, yes, of course. And so Alec appeared about a week later. And we sat in a cafe and watched nine and a half minutes of silent footage, which the sound had been lost, which was all shot in and around Melbourne here, particularly around Fitzroy and Little George Street. And as we watched, I saw these incredible images of strength. I mean, it was people battling in the most adverse conditions, but at the same time, this was incredibly different from the from the very deficit-based discourse that was going on around Aboriginal people and culture. I felt, even without the, the voiceover, this was depicting community building. This was depicting people in strength. It showed Pastor Doug Nichols' church in Gore Street. It showed people reviving cultural practice. It was it was an eye-opener mm. for me. And so this really piqued my interest, particularly the, the stuff that pertained to cultural reclamation and uh, and revitalisation. It's a subject that's very close to my heart. Mm. And so we, we started going on this detective journey and it was extraordinary how much of the story that we started to uncover through a blaze as we, as we sought to give provenance to the film. Mm. And we're then, talking about that, that footage being from 1946. 1946, that's yeah. right. And I just, I want Alec to just jump in, if you don't mind, Ricky, and just tell us, how did you find the footage? How did you come across it to make the phone call? Well, um, connecting back to Laszlo's sixpence, um, Bill, is, Bill is a relative of some people in that film, Yorda Yorda, Auntie Margaret Tucker. Um, so I knew Bill's story and I knew Bill's image and a lot of my work uh, over the last um, 40 odd years really has been Australian history, mainly archival film. So uh, when I looked at this film, I th first of all saw Bill Onus, recognised Bill Onus, then I recognised his brother Eric. Um, and it had a play in there where a white stockman was chaining an Aboriginal actor up, which, who was Eric Onus. So I was very curious, what was this political play? It looked like 1946. So that's when I rang Terraki up um, and said, you know, I found this nine and a half piece, minute piece of film. And um, it, no, no, there was no sound with it. Um, so that's where we all started from there in the archive, you know, finding that in the archive. And it's extraordinary to see the footage of the three Indigenous youth um, and the Bell and Howe 35 millimeter movie camera. Um, you must have been blown away when you um, found some stills in your home and you'd found the footage at the National Archives and you two came together to start to, to tell this story. Well, the first thing that Terraki told me, which is which we re tell in the, in the film, is you know, from Terraki's father, uh, Lynn, who passed away tragically young. But as a boy, Terraki heard the story about from his father that Bill had made films, but they were lost in a caravan fire. Mm. And it was kind of like all oh, these rumours every so often that people say they found a Bill film. So there was this kind of story floating around. That's what mm. he told mm. Matt, me. And, and so there was already, so it was totally, in, I, I, you know, the thing about research is the detective story. I think that's, you know, the fascination that mm. you find, you know, you smell there's something in here and you you just go for it. Um, mm. So kind of like that. Well, it was I, quite extraordinary, I think. Oh, sorry. No, no, please. I was just saying, to, to, to find uh, the different pieces, this is the point I was making before, the different pieces of story that had have come together, of which we were aware but didn't have any context for, all of a sudden there was this efflorescence of, of, of information where everything started to make sense. And I think that was very, very exciting when we started to see just how interconnected things were. I think I needed to go back to your point there that all of this stuff was there. 
we just didn't have any way to read it before then. And that's that's been a very exciting part too. Yeah, it's incredible. I'm, look, I know your, fa your grandfather um, died 12 years before you were born. Mm. Why don't we have a look at the trailer? Because I think it's, it's quite a surprise. And I personally feel a bit embarrassed that I didn't know anything about your grandfather. And I really think that people should. So uh, let's have a look at the trailer. When my daughter Ninda was born, I wrapped her in a possum skin cloak. It's part of my culture. On the first skin, I burned what I knew about my grandfather, William Townsend Onus. But there are things about my grandfather that still remain a mystery. Bill, the successful entrepreneur, the theatre impresario, the entertainer, the fighter for his people's rights. But one photograph really made me curious. I'd been told by my father, Lynn, that Bill made movies, that he might be the first Aboriginal filmmaker. Did my grandfather make this film? And if he did make it, why did he make it? In those days, you never had any assistance. There was nothing for black fellas. You're excluded from going into public places. And if you were able to go to the movies, you could only sit down in the front stalls. Bill would go and talk anywhere to anyone to keep Koori culture alive. Don't just let it go off quietly into the past. The story goes that most of his movies were burnt up in a caravan fire. But there are rumours that some of Bill's films are still out there. Hey, Tedeke, Tedeke, oh, good to see you, big fella. <laughs> Terrific. This footage is extremely rare. To see this today for the first time is fascinating for me. It was just so good for us to see an Aboriginal man telling our stories. William Onus really made an impact on my life. We cannot help but wonder why it had taken the white Australians just on 200 years to recognise us as a race of people. I'm speaking for what I firmly believe. And each and everything I said, I do not apologise for. entrepreneurial and <laughs> such an interesting character why were you so driven to tell his story I think I've always lived very closely to Bill even though there's 12 years in life that separates us I think he's always been part of this mythology of my family and and I can't I can't go anywhere out in the Victorian Aboriginal community without being accosted by an old auntie who wants to tell me just how much I look like him as well, which is always lovely. But I think these were really important stories. And I think I've always felt to some extent that because Bill was so dedicated and dogged with his work and because he didn't really care about getting the credit for things necessarily he was much more concerned that things should happen than whose name was on them that to some extent i suppose part of his story had fallen beside the wayside he was very good at promoting other people it probably wasn't mm. so crash hot on the self-promotion mm. and i thought that was an important but because within all of that there's so much more of that story because i don't think this is necessarily just a story about Bill, because there are so many people that have come together to empower this conversation, to make it happen. It's all of Bill and his contemporaries, everyone who were working together in some wonderful choreography almost to make these inroads, to make change and, and, and to address these great injustices that I suppose to some extent I felt that I couldn't not tell it. Mm. If that was, yeah, that's not, that's the double negatives, but you get my opinion. I, I couldn't I do, not tell I do. I do. I, I must say, and I, I think I said this to you uh, when we spoke offline about, and though obviously people haven't seen haven't seen the, the film yet, mm. but towards the end, you go on a journey and you take that footage back into the community and show them that mm. footage from 1946. And I found that particularly emotional. And I wondered how both of you felt when you were filming it. And at that moment, to me, it was almost like that where that film really 
you know, just it resonated so strongly with me that that history and that story need to be told. Is that how you both felt? Um, well, um, well, the, the footage of the play turned out to be what Bill Onus had put on stage at the New Theatre mm. about the 1946 strike by Indigenous stock workers in the Pilbara region. So it's the communities uh, who, had, who are descendants of those strikers we took it to. Um, I suppose, um, given that COVID was threatening us with um, the shoot, it was great to go back there and see it. I mean, it's such a great positive community and their education. The school rooms were amazing. We wanted to show more of that. But yeah, we had to get the shoot done as quick as we could. It's about 200 kilometres out of Port Hedland and get out of there. We caught, caught the last plane out of there. Otherwise, we could have not, you know, the lockdown happened. But um, no, it was wonderful to go to the actual community of strikers. And, mm. and they were very supportive all the way through the film, of course, you know, going across the research. Mm. Um, you know, so um, great people. Great mm. Extraordinary people, I think. And, you know, I mean, literally the last shot of the film is filmed on the way driving to the airport to get out before before COVID struck. But mm. for me, I think it was, there was a, a real sense of of trying to finish some business there as well for for Bill. I mean, if you go through Bill's ASIO file and his correspondence, you can see him talking about the films that he wants to make, him trying to get permits to be able to go into other states and territories to make films and largely being knocked back for almost everything that he tries. So to finally go to the Pilbara, even after 70 or, or nearly 75 years since the film, by the time we got there in the end, was somewhat extraordinary to be able to, to finally get back and make a connection that Bill never managed to make in his lifetime. Mm. Mm. But at least, you know, I, as Bill's grandson and the grandchildren of those original strikers, were able to connect up and and finally bring some some sort of uh, closure to that wheel in some mm. ways. It's, it was quite a gift. It really was. And when will audiences be able to actually see this film? Is it uh, with the Melbourne... Uh, I'm gathering with COVID and the film festival, Melbourne Film Festival. When are you expecting well, to be able to see it? Well, in Melbourne, officially, it's meant to be next Tuesday the 17th. Um, um, it was going to go on in October at the Antenna Film Festival in Sydney, but that's been put aside till February. Umbrella Entertainment's are planning a cinema release, but everything's, because of COVID, is everything's up in the air at the moment. Mm. Um, yeah. Can I, I um, Annabelle and Stamatino, I'd like to jump back to you both and misrepresent it. In terms of passion projects, and that was clearly a passion project to both of you, what were some of the challenges and hurdles that you encountered? in terms of telling all of those stories and pulling the series together that we can learn from? Well, I think, I mean, I'm just so relating um, to what James and uh, what Jane and Tiriki and Alex have said, because I think one of the great challenges of um, choosing a story um, and getting cracking on telling it is that it's sort of like writing fiction when you've been writing nonfiction all your life. It's because you, you have to set the parameters of your own story and you can hear from what Jane was saying how the parameters of her project changed over the course of it. Um, and um, obviously, Ablaze was like a voyage of discovery, right? It was like it's it was mm. its own journey as well as a film. And that is what is incredibly exciting about passion projects, I think, is because you know more at the end than you know at the beginning. And yeah. that is an amazing thing. You're not only making a film that educates or informs other people but it also takes you to places that you're perhaps not ready for and I think that um the the challenge for us with misrepresented was we were looking at a hundred years uh full of women some of whom you've heard of and some of whom you haven't and their stories were kind of equally powerful even though you know so we were dealing with big choices to make about um how to structure um, a series like this, how to take advantage of um, four 30-minute episodes to mm -hmm. try and deliver a larger truth than could ever be crammed into that 
small airtime um, about what it meant to be um, uh, a woman in parliament for all the years between 1921 and, and 2021. So yeah, in some ways it's really, um, it's a question about finding a perimeter or finding a shape to make this sort of um, huge universe of information the most powerful and the most um, sensible to the audience. And I think, I think what you're also saying is, and Stamatia, you might have a view of it, it's important that content reflects the world that we live in, <laughs> that, you know, it really brings that uh, to life in so many different ways. And all your stories that you're talking about to me bring various aspects of our lives to life. And I think that's the importance of what passion projects also can do. Is that something that you all believe in, share? Alec? Mm. Well, for me, it's always been a passion to know about Australia. Um, I mean, the reason for making Lazarus Six was because, because I couldn't read anything about it. Mm. Uh, I mean, you know, it was like there's been this massive silence in Australian's history. And um, so we're still uncovering it. Um, even And so going, um, picking up what Anna, Annabelle is saying is, um, it's always a journey that you're going on. I love that journey where you suddenly, you know, you spend an extra hour in the research and you discover mm -hmm. something that you have no idea that this had occurred. And particularly with someone like Bill Onus and Aboriginal history, where a lot of things are not written down. I mean, we still don't know who shot the film um, because in those days it was Cold War, 1946. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we understand now that um, you know, they were being under surveillance by the government. And so it was dangerous for anybody with any progressive ideas to admit that they worked on a particular film. You just wouldn't work again, probably, you know, in, in a government film unit or even on the newsreels. So discovering the past for me is a journey of, yes, this is what really happened. Um, you know, this is, this is the place I live. This is, the, this is the country I live on, and I'm on that generation of the Pat Fisk generation, the Martha and Sarah generation. We were furious that we were being denied our history. Mm. You know, we wanted to know the land we live on, not Great Britain and the British Empire. Um, we grew up with learning more about that than the actual land we live on. And so there's still a lot of story to be told about Australia, a lot. And I, I guess, too, it's, it's about exploring themes of identity and belonging that are really, I think, important in storytelling. Mm, mm, hugely, I think. And I think these are very human stories and questions about how we make our belonging as well. And one of the things that I'm really excited about with The Blaze and with all of the work looking at, at everything that Bill does is that now in, in the space that we currently inhabit where... I have non-Indigenous colleagues and friends and family who want to be involved, who want to provide meaningful allyship in, in the struggle of reclaiming language and country and, and culture and story and so on. But so often, I think we feel like it's got to be done from scratch. And the more we uncover this story, the more we see that, in fact, there have been great women and great men, non-Aboriginal people, who have stepped across these artificially imposed cultural chasms, if you will, mm. and have sought to make change. And this is a very exciting part of that story about how we create an identity for ourselves collectively in this space and where we can find the great heroes that we reach back to and understand that this has been going on for a very long time and it's part of our shared identity and why should we not be able to celebrate it much more fulsomely than what we currently do. Mm, yeah, no, absolutely. I just wanted to um, just jump in for a moment. There was something I was going to ask you, Alec, about doing a deep dive into the National Archives and finding stories mm -hmm. and what a resource it is for people who might be watching today to look for stories, uh, to tell them. And, you know, um, Annabelle, you might, or Stamatia, somebody might also have a comment. To me, they are a natural resource for storytelling and oh. we don't use them enough. Oh, absolutely. Look, we will live in the 21st century. Um, Macquarie, you know, we still don't take the visual history of this country seriously enough. Um, and, and I think that's shown by the fact that um, the National Film and Sound Archive is always struggling for funds. Mm. 
Mm. I mean, when I started off years ago, it used to be in the basement of the National Library. And I think our university is to blame as well. I mean, book is seen as more important than film. But visual history tells something that you can't describe in, in book. I mean, they're value in both. And I think we should value it far more. I mean, I've spent so much time discovering the past visually uh, in the National Film and Sound Archive. And yet I know that the tragedy that they're going through today is they, they don't have any money for public outreach. They can't get it out to Australians to know their own history. Uh, they, their bookshops closed down. They used to make DVDs of their material. You could, you know, look at stuff. They used to have people visiting there, but it's all sort of thing of the past now. So, um, yeah, that's a very important um, visual history is a very important part of what we seem to neglect mm. uh, as far as, and, and yes, it costs a lot of money to preserve, but, mm. you know, we live in the 21st century, not the 19th. No. Um, we've got a couple of questions. Annabelle, one for you. Tell us about the women who aren't in the film, and there's some obvious ones. Did they turn you down? And I guess we're talking about Pauline Hanson and maybe Jackie Lambie or I don't know. You, you and Stamatia will know much better than I do. <laughs> well, the, the, the first answer is that there are heaps of women that aren't in the film because um, we had to make a short list, really, and it's incredibly challenging because when you choose a series of people to interview, you're missing out on the stories of others. So we were super clear from the beginning that we weren't trying to cover the field of stories of women in, in Parliament. What we mainly wanted to do was to deliver a collection of recollections and human reflections. And one of the really major driving forces we had was to try and show that sometimes they um, occur across party boundaries, across generational boundaries. We wanted it to be like an oral history of women telling stories sort of to each other and the sort of stories that they told often, you know, to each other and not to anyone else, which is why a lot of these stories and experiences have been um, under told. And mm -hmm. so um, that drove our decision to have only women interviewed. We didn't interview any men. Um, and um, we kind of went by thumb to kind of um, focus on women who were firsts of some kind. That was that really um, dictated most of our choices. So some of those were easy, first female prime minister, first female governor general, defence minister, foreign minister, and so on. But we wanted to get a spread across parties um, and generations as well. So, of course, there are people that we didn't interview um, and um, there were some who declined. And Pauline Hanson, we asked a number of times. We've, um, Stan and I have tried to get her involved in other projects that we've done, like the series that we made, a uh, documentary series about Parliament House. But I think, you know, Pauline Hanson has a pretty cautious approach to the ABC historically. Um, she mm. seems sort of keener on Channel 7 um, and Channel 7 weren't making <laughs> this project. So. Channel 7. To give it context. Yeah. So, yeah, we did, um, and then we, we had some other people who, who said no. I mean, I guess, look, it's obviously it's a sort of a posterity project. Um, people, some people were really willing to subject themselves to long interviews where they were asked only about gender, really. And that doesn't really happen, I think, um, to women in politics very much. And I think historically there has been a real caution or disinclination from women in politics to talk expressly about gender because they tend of often to be accused then of whinging or complaining or, you know, committing the cardinal sin of making it all about yourself. Um, I think that the fact that this was a centenary of women in parliament sort of historical project got a lot of them over the line. It felt like mm. they had permission to talk about that stuff. But... Mm. Um, for some women, they weren't, you know, up for it. So, yeah, we did not that many. We had some women who, who declined. And uh, who were they? Well, I would say, I don't want to, you know... Oh, um, can you throw any names out? I mean, oh, <laughs> well, I mean, we had... Um, the, they were mainly Conservative women. We had uh, a couple of National Party uh, groundbreaking women who, you know, very politely um, declined. We were talking to Peter Credlin, who I think... Um, despite not technically being a first, she wasn't the first woman to be a Prime Minister's Chief of Staff, but she was 
a massively significant and influential um, part of the Abbott government. And she, in the end, um, after a few chats, um, was too busy uh, to, to be involved, which I regret, yeah. Thank you, Annabelle. Um, Jane, there's a question for you from the audience. Uh, you mentioned intergenerational trauma. Did you experience healing through viewing your family through the eye of the lens? Absolutely. I mean, it was, um, I think the main part of the healing was um, over that eight year period of putting what had been really quite overwhelming and, um, you know, hard to make sense of, putting it into form. And, and in order to do that, I had to do a lot of research into both my parents and their parents, so going back down the generations. And so I learned a lot about the trauma um, that both my parents experienced and that came down the next generation. So, yeah, finding out more, making it make sense and, um, and also um, the act of telling a story um, because, you know, one of the, you know, legacies of trauma is that you kind of, you sit with your own story and it's really mm. hard to share it because you think you're just unique, terminally unique, you know, you just, um, and so there's a lot of shame that comes with telling a story. So being able to um, put it into an art form. And in, in fact, we had some psychologists and psychiatrists um, and psychoanalysts have a look at the film and they were saying it's a great example of sublimation where instead of acting out the trauma, you you put it into, I don't know if this is the right, the exact description of what sublimation is, but you put it into a form that is acceptable. And so I think, you know, I didn't plan to do this, but in the telling of the story, I turned what was kind of unacceptable and disturbing and horrible and dark into something kind of in a beautiful form, like um, there's beauty and there's poetry, especially visually, it's quite beautiful. So like on many levels, it was a healing journey for me. And I was also doing therapy the whole way through, which was a kind of a parallel process and I needed needed to be doing both. And I guess also as storytellers, we don't uh, by definition do vulnerability uh, outwardly. So I think for all of you, um, finding and doing that deep dive is can sometimes be very challenging in doing your passion project. Uh, Tariki, is that what you found? Hugely so. Mm. Hugely so. And I, I mean, I, I, I wonder at times, has this been a catharsis for me or has this traumatised me in different <laughs> ways? <laughs> and and I mean, in, in, in some ways, quite seriously, because whilst I've, I've really come even further to grips with knowing my grandfather's story and understanding where I fit in the world, the more one uncovers through this process, the more one realises how much work there is still to do and and almost that it, 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 it can at times, I mean, for me, certainly add, I think, to to the responsibility of the weight that uh, and the expectations that I place on myself. No one else is doing it to me. I'm doing it to myself. Fully acknowledge that. Mm. Uh, in what one carries forward. Ultimately, I think it's it's incredibly strengthening. But at the same time, it's... It can be difficult for me sometimes, certainly, to to view the enormity of these stories and mm -hmm. what that intergenerational narrative is, and indeed, for me, to come to terms with why I'm even here. Like, how how the hell did people live through what they've lived through yeah. to the point that they that they could not just survive but thrive, and then have kids who then too went on? It's it's daunting at times. Yes, it is. There's, there's another question that um, from the audience. Do you have to be an established filmmaker to make a passion project? Um, Stamatia, what do you think? Um, no. I mean, <laughs> this is going to sound crazy, but I've been doing this for like 20 years and I still don't think I know what I'm doing. So um, <laughs> uh, the answer to that is no. I think um, if you've got a story, um, and it's worth telling. There's always a way to figure out how to do that. And there's so many different avenues in which you can do that now. So um, I, I, I think just go for it, really. Mm. Yeah, I, th I think it's actually a positive not to be an established filmmaker because you can get in these, you know, habits of 
oh, this is the kind of story I can tell and this is how to tell it. And I, I really relate, uh, Samata, like I was, I'd never made a 75-minute film before. I had no idea how to hold an audience for that amount of time and it's not bloody easy. And it was, um, I just had, I read books about, you know, script writing and structure and I got all these script editors to come in and I learned from the bottom up about how to, you know, like, because really um, these films are, they have, they're fictions. They have a fictional structure to, even though they're documentaries, they're still stories and they need to work. So, yeah, I had no idea how to, I was a cinematographer. I had made one documentary like 20 years earlier uh, for SBS, but I actually, I also felt like I didn't know what I was doing most of the time. So... <laughs> Probably quite a few of us in the same boat. Yeah. Alec, did you want to add something? Oh, yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, it's the best place to start. If you've got the passion, that's where you start from. Yeah. And that, that's a driving force. I mean, you drive your, with your passion to tell a story. And I, you know, I didn't go to film school. I, you know, I sort of learned um, out with Essie Coffey and, you know, the first Aboriginal filmmaker and Martha Ansara and those people who, who had actually gone to film school, but you know, it's just the passion that you feel that you you drive forward, and sometimes you feel you you make probably as a filmmaker you make more mistakes than anybody else in the world, but no one notices that when you get it up on the screen, right? You, um, but it it makes you alive. I mean, you know, I I I was deeply proud of my early films and working with Essie way back then, and you know, allows a little sixpence, and I'm deeply proud of getting this film finished. At the end, you think it's never going to get made. We got tossed out of everywhere, you know, and there, but then you pick up people who support you. You know, there's jo Tom Zabricki, the producer. When we got tossed out, Tom would just, you know, go back again and find a strategy and a way in. You know, mm. you don't work alone in the end. You, you mm. start, mm. you might start alone but you don't work alone in film. You get people who love what you're trying to do, even when you have extreme doubts about it. Listen to those people, because they, they've picked up on what your vision is. And, you, you know, I, I can hardly turn on a computer. And I did a film once with 350 special effects. I can draw, but I don't know how they did it. You know, like, just mm. let your passion drive you and, you know, go crazy with it. Um, yeah. Jane, you're with um, uh, uh, When the Camera Stopped Rolling. That's been nominated for an actor award. Um, but you've stepped aside to become an environmental campaigner. Will we see you once again embrace filmmaking? Um, I'm going to have a break because that <laughs> film almost killed me. Um, yeah, so maybe I have said, um, you know, I've thrown filmmaking away several times, like, never again. I'm never going to make another film. Um, and so that's where I am right now. I never want to make another film, but um, <laughs> I've also been known to um, change my mind. And like, you know, when an idea just takes hold of you, it like, oh my God, and then you become a slave to it. It's almost like you have no say. So I'm just gonna hold my fire on that and see what happens after a big oh. rest. Yeah, no, that sounds that sounds wise. I think we've got about three minutes left, and I was—I I think I mentioned to you all about final words of wisdom, advice on passion projects. Annabelle, do you want to jump in and add to this discussion? Yeah, look, I, I'm so moved by what Jane said just now because um, I think Stam and I have told each other we're never going to make <laughs> anything else a few times. Um, but that idea of letting a, a story find you, like. That's what actually really defines a passion project, I think. You're not mm -hmm. filling a gap that somebody else has created and says, we need content to go here. You're, you know, you're birthing something, you know, you're making something new, you're adding to the universe, and that is massively valuable. Um, but in some ways, the sort of the great downside of the passion project, which is you probably won't get paid for it <laughs> at any point. <laughs> and if you do, it'll be at the most risible hourly rate you could possibly imagine, is also that kind of upside for it, which is that time can be on your side. You know, you actually have, you can have the time to, to hatch it like an egg, you know. And with all of these projects that we've been hearing about today, they they changed over the process, over the productive production process, right? Like what you ended up with was something different from what you started with because of this, you know, 
journey, um, much as I sort of loathe that word, um, th that you went on just to make the damn thing. So that is actually an intricate and super valuable part of it. And it's also sort of free to a certain extent. I mean, you can um, do that, you know, hatching and um, that, that intense labour of thought and personal development, um, you know, at your own pace. Ricky, what do you think your grandfather would feel or say to you um, about a blaze? Have you wondered that? I have, and I don't, and and I still wonder. To be perfectly, <laughs> to be perfectly frank, I don't know. Uh, I know the things that I say to myself that you know, that make me feel better about it. But I'm really proud of the story that we were told there, as uh, as I know Alec is also, and. I do think that he'd be proud of it too. I mean, a blaze in some ways, to even take myself out of it, is is very much the epitome of a passion project because it's actually, I see myself as bringing a passion project of my grandfather's from 1946 mm. to some kind of close as well. And, and that ability to be passionate about a story for that long and to eventually be able to tell it is is an extraordinary gift. Mm. I mean, these are the these are the things that we do, right? We do stuff because on some level, when it's about passion, we feel that we have to, or that the, the, the pain of making it is not going to be so great as the pain of not making it. So mm. <laughs> you you go through and you totally. and you do it. I think that that wouldn't happen if people hadn't told each other stories. And I think that's if if there is that story that you're passionate about, then you have to keep telling it. And if stories hadn't been passed down from my grandfather to my father, from my father to me, and now from me uh, to my three daughters, who are six, three, and one, so they're not quite able to understand all of it yet, but they're, they're, getting, they're getting inculcated early. But these stories would have stopped. And it's a beautiful gift to be able to tell. I don't know what Bill thinks, but I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure he and I, are, are, we're doing okay. Good on you. Now that's great. Look, thank you all very much for a great discussion, for your time, you. for your work, for your storytelling. And I, you know, I really appreciate your time today. And I know that the audience would have got a lot out of it. So thank you all very much and all the best with your films and your work. And uh, thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, Anita. Thank, thank you. Anita. Bye. Thank you.